me, Sarah here. Um, yeah, it probably is just better to give a quick video than it is trying to talk over the telephone. Um, so the EpiPen, well, actually, it's actually an auto-injector. There are different brands of EpiPen uh, auto-injectors, but this is the most common one that you will see around. And they've all got the same uh, idea, meaning that they all have adrenaline inside. So anaphylactic, it's when somebody's body um, rejects whatever has gone into them. So, for example, if they've been stung by a bee or if they're allergic to nuts, etc. So it's when there is a sudden drop in their blood pressure and when this blood pressure drops so suddenly then blood can't circulate so that's why they then find it really difficult to <gasps> breathe and they start swelling up and it is it's life-threatening sometimes I get uh, on courses people say oh yeah well I've got uh, you know um, it's flour with me or um, oh if I eat such and such then it makes me you know makes my eyes stream when they're out and about that is different. It's more an intolerance to certain things. So, for example, people around pollen, they get hay fever. It's an intolerance. Your body doesn't like it, but it's not life-threatening. But anaphylactis is. So this bit of equipment here, the EpiPen. So when people get prescribed it, so they would have had an episode at some point of a reaction to food or whether it's bee stings, etc. And um, they would have been by prescription an auto injector. And they would have had the training as well. If they're able to inject it to themselves, then fine. But sometimes we as first aiders may have to administer it if they can't do it themselves. So let's have a look at it. So um, they actually come in a clear case. And the clear case is just to protect it so it doesn't just fall out, especially women in handbags. Um, how to store them. Again, you are not responsible for the storage of these. Whoever it's prescribed to, it's their responsibility to make sure it is stored carefully. But um, they recommend to have out of sunlight. So, yeah, not sitting in the sun. Stored below 25 degrees centigrade as well, must not be kept in a fridge or into a freezer. So just an ambient room temperature is absolutely fine. How do they know if it's um, active ingredient? Is it ready to use? On these training pens, it doesn't actually show you, but in the real ones, there's like um, a clear you can actually see through it and you can see if the liquid is clear. If it's clear, great. If it becomes murky and um, off color, then they need to contact the pharmacy and get replacement. The shelf life of these, uh, they can be up to two years, but the actual EpiPen brand is around about uh, 18 months. So they must make sure they check it on a regular basis, like once a month to make sure that it is clear and also that it is in date. If it's expired, then they need to get hold of their pharmacist, doctors and get a new prescription. Most of the time they're prescribed at two. Um, so they've always, well, I'll explain a little bit more on how much you can actually administer. So it's not your responsibility to check them. It's the person's responsibility to make sure it is in date. So um, how much stuff is in it? So it is adrenaline. And how does adrenaline work? So if you, as I mentioned, anaphylactis is when there's a sudden drop in blood pressure. So in here is adrenaline. And it's the adrenaline that will increase the blood pressure and in turn stop pumping the blood around the bottom, uh, around the, the body more effectively. And it well, hopefully it will save lives. So this is why they're so, so uh, important. And also be great to be trained in how to administer it as well. So an adult dosage has got 0.3 milligrams of adrenaline, an adult one, notice the word. How do they differentiate between whether they'll have a junior EpiPen or an adult one? A junior EpiPen is up to 30 kilos in weight. So around about, I think it's 12 years old. Anything above 30 kilos in weight, then it would be an adult. In the adult one, as I mentioned, there's 0.3 milligrams. In a junior one, there's exactly half of that. So 0.15 uh, milligrams. The size of the needle is slightly different size as well. In an adult one, it's 16 mil length. In a junior one, it's 13 mil. So three millimeters difference. 
that really doesn't matter uh, for yourselves to know that, but just thought I would say. So um, if you ever have to administer one, then you take it out of the, the plastic casing and you will see here that it's got a blue cap. This is a safety cap and that must be in place. Well, it would be anyway if it's come out of the, the um, clear holding case, if you like. And this in place means it's safe. The needle comes out of the orange bit. So as you can see, it's fine. You're not going to injure anybody. So we need to activate it. So what position ideally would we like people to be in to administer it? Because anaphylactic is a sudden drop in blood pressure, there's a real good chance that they're going to collapse anyway. So it's really better to get them on the ground so that if they did collapse, if they did go unresponsive, they're not going to fall so far and they don't cause any further injury to themselves. So ideally, sitting or lying down on the ground is okay. If they're struggling to breathe, then sit them up. And we're going to get the EpiPen and you know even leaning up against a wall is really good as well because it gives them support so the epi pen what you need to do is now make sure that you don't have your hand close to the orange bit otherwise you're going to inject yourself so we need to remove the blue safety cap it is now live also as a reminder there are all the instructions on how to use the epi pen okay so if you forget have a quick read so we want to make sure that we keep the orange bit and we want to, the upper out of thigh. I'll explain why this particular part in just a few moments. We want to inject it to a 90 degree angle. So the upper outer thigh, and it's important that we do it here. So not on top, 90 degree angle. Ideally about 10 centimeters away from the body. So you don't need to run and jump at it like a javelin, but 10 centimeters away and nice and firm, we're going to inject you heard that click there that means that it has been activated and i'm actually counting to the count of 10 6 7 8 9 10 and remove so you can see here i'm just going to move for you just now you can give that a bit of a rub as well to encourage it you can see that the orange bit comes out that we know has been activated and the orange bit is there for safety you will not see the needle. The orange bit protects the needle so that you can't, you know, stab yourself on it. So once it's used, we always advise to call an ambulance. So when the ambulance crew arrive, you can give them this EpiPen and they will dispose of it safely for you. OK, job done. So what if though you're waiting for the ambulance to arrive and the symptoms, as in the breathing still lay with the <gasps> still struggling to breathe, can you use another one? The answer is you can. Um, most people who uh, have these, they will get given two of them. Now, they might not have the two with them, but if they did have a second one, if they're still struggling to breathe five to 15 minutes after the first injection, you can administer another one if they've got it, okay? So just to recap, so the blue bit here is for safety. Make sure you remove it. Upper outer thigh, and we want it at a 90 degree angle, and we want to approximately 10 centimeters away and inject. Hold it in for the count of 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight and a half, nine, 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 ten, and release. Now, when you release the needle, you may see residue um, still coming out. That's fine. That is normal. Um, but you've got the adrenaline in. So let's have a look at a few things then to be mindful of. And why do we do them? So why the upper outer thigh? The reason why we do it in this part of the body is because this is the largest muscle that we have. And also the skin is thinner, so it can actually get into the muscle where we need it. If we do the upper part, look, I'll show you. There's a lot more, how do I put this? Hmm. Excess fat, if you like. So that is the reason why we want to do it here because we don't want it to go into the fat. We want it to get into the muscle as quickly as possible and then it can start circulating around the body. Up here, it takes longer. And lots of people say, well, why can't you do it in the backside? Again, there's a lot more excess fat. Hmm. 
bits that we don't particularly like. So upper outer thigh, that's where we want to do it. People say, yeah, but why not the upper upper arm? Again, it's not the largest muscle. And if you think about it, 16 mil in an adult one, 13, you're going to be hitting off bone and it's going to be extremely painful. So why do they need to go into hospital then if this has worked and the breathing comes back to normal and they're okay? The reason why they need to still go into hospital is because the best way I describe this is a bit like an earthquake. So if you can imagine, you have an earthquake, yeah, and the whole flipping place. I don't know if you've ever been in one. I've been in one in my life and oh, trust me, it pooped my pants. So if you can imagine an earthquake and then it stops. So imagine that anaphylactic attack. It's, <gasps> they have that initial attack and this works and they go back to normal. The reason why they need to advise or go to hospital is because they will need to be monitored for up to six hours. And the reason why that is because there is risk of an aftershock. And if they have an aftershock, just like an earthquake, you get aftershocks, then they are in the safest place and they will uh, be able to administer more adrenaline um, and check oxygen levels, etc. while they're in hospital. So that is the reason why. Um, what else can I tell you about these things? Oh, what if somebody passes out and they collapse? What do you do? You go back to your usual Dr. ABC, of course, because you all know how to do that because you're all trainers. But what position would you put them into if they're not breathing? You're right. You are absolutely right. It is the recovery position. There's a few things we need to be mindful of, though. And you may have read in notes and stuff that. But what if the person is um, pregnant? And they say, but that not damaged, that not hurt the baby. They've been prescribed this and the use of this outweighs any potential risk of um, harming the, the baby inside. So they always ad advise to administer it because research shows that it will very, very rarely cause any, any harm at all to the baby. So we must get that injected. So we get the person into recovery position if they're breathing. But what if that person is pregnant? What position do we ideally put that lady into? Which side? You're right, it's the left-hand side. But why? Why do we put pregnant women onto the left-hand side? Here's the reason why. If you don't know, then it's great. And if you do know, then fantastic. Then, well, you can just press stop now if you like. But I'm just going to give you a quick diagram. Now, I didn't get this job for um, artwork. Sorry, art teacher. So I'm going to just draw very briefly <laughs> a pregnant lady. Right. So head, neck, body, legs. See, I have to tell you what each bit is because you, otherwise you wouldn't know what it is I'm doing. I'm going to give her some arms as well. Let's put a little bit of a face on it. You're not very happy, this one. Okay, right. So let us pop baby into mummy. They're always happy when they're in there. So let's have a look why the left-hand side. So, red pen. Heart. Blue pen. Right, so getting serious now. So let's say this is a person absolutely fine, no problems at all, but of course she is pregnant. So in every human being, we have veins, um, arteries, and you name it. On the left-hand side, so as you're looking the right, but on the left-hand side, we have uh, a vein, and I'm going to draw it like this. It's not exactly on the left, it's actually, anyway, for demonstration purposes. 
This vein has got a lot of power, a lot of pressure behind it, and it's called the vena cava superior. You don't need to remember this. Vena cava superior. On the right-hand side of our body, we have another vein. And I'm going to draw it like this. It doesn't have as much pressure. This is called the vena cava inferior. You with me? So let's just break this down. The vein on the left-hand side has got a lot of power. It's like a waterfall. The power is gushing, gushing a lot of power behind it. And this vein here is just like a, like a stream. It's trickling. So why the left-hand side of the body? Imagine if a person, a pregnant lady was to collapse, if we put the pregnant lady onto her right-hand side, onto her right-hand side, all the pressure is going to squash, squash, squash down this vein and it's going to restrict the flow of oxygen, the blood flowing around the body. So if, well, we should put the pregnant lady onto her left-hand side because this vein has got so much pressure, it can afford for the baby to lean onto this vein. Onto this vein. So if the baby's putting pressure onto this vein, because it's got so much pressure, the blood can still circulate around the body without a hindrance. So that's why it's really important that we put a pregnant lady always onto the left-hand side. But remember, you are gonna be on the phone to 999 and they're gonna ask you these questions. So then what happened? Well, I don't know if she got stung by a bee, she had an EpiPen, I administered it to her, she passed out. And uh, so I, you know, I've got her on the left-hand side they're going to talk you through everything. So even if you went through that mad panic of like, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? EpiPen, EpiPen, do I, do I, do I not? Do I, will I, won't I? Always remember that even if somebody was uncertain, administering this into somebody outweighs the negatives. Um, so the other thing I get asked is, but what if somebody's got a heart condition? Again, doctors look at this, which is worse? If they've got a heart condition, would administering this cause problems to them? The answer is that they, they will work out the pros, the cons, and it's up to the doctor whether or not they actually prescribe one of these to the person. That's not your headache. If they've got one, you use it. What if, though, they've left their EpiPen at home? They haven't got it with them. Here's the good news. You can, of course, you've got an ambulance on the way. You can contact, get to a pharmacy, get somebody to go to the pharmacy. You tell them that somebody's having an anaphylactic reaction. They've left the EpiPen at home. They will come with you. They use their judgment. They are allowed to do this and they are able to get this and take it and administer it to them because they have the, the guidance and the medical knowledge. So they are able to administer this for you. So it's a case of what comes first, the ambulance with adrenaline or whether it's the pharmacist with the adrenaline if they didn't have it on them. So I hope this answers um, some of your questions. If you have any further questions, just trying to see, do I need to say anything else? Da, 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 Nope, I think not. Oh, yeah, one thing. Now I've mentioned to you that when we administer it, yeah, right, blue cap off, orange bit, 90 degree angle. We count to 10. Now you may see on the right up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine and a half, ten. You may see and read on sites that it says it only takes three seconds to get this into the person. The reason why we advise as trainers um, 10 seconds is just to make sure that it has gone in as opposed to one, two, three, and it hasn't. Longer is not worse. Longer is fine. You could hold it there for 30 seconds if you wanted to. But when you're advising how to train it, 10 seconds. And if they say, is there any difference between the EpiPens, whether they got stung by a bee, whether they ate nuts, whether it is whatever the cause is, it makes no difference. It's exactly the same for whatever the cause is. But also remember, 
it's a good idea to remove the source. So if it was a bee sting that caused the anaphylactic, try and get the bee sting out. If it was nuts, if they'd been eating a muffin or something and it had nuts and that was the trigger, move the muffin away. Just get whatever the danger was out of the way. Job done. Any questions? Happy to answer if I know the answer. <laughs> All right, take care. Let me see if I can switch this off now. Might have gone bad. There we are. Bye.